This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Me to introduce the speaker, who is an old friend of the seminar, and um, is very welcome this evening, Alice Dolan, University of Hertfordshire, and, um, and all that, and who's speaking to the title the. Um, at first, nothing could be more shocking the impact of the 1678 Act for Bearing and Water. Thanks, Jim. So, my PhD thesis is a stu- uh, the first study of the social and cultural significance of linen during the long 18th century. And linen's a really fascinating textile because everyone wore it, however rich or poor they were. So, it offers a way of um, exploring everyday life across the social hierarchy. The thesis is structured around life cycle, which emphasises the ubiquity of linen and um, also allows examination of why linen remained a daily necessity during this period, um, whilst cotton became a viable alternative. So today I'm going to talk about my final chapter, which is on death, highly appropriate for the party day, you know, memento moro, memento mori. In 1666, an act for burying in woolen only was passed to ban burial in linen, and the act was intended to promote the English woolen trade and reduce English um, linen imports and coinage exports. The benefits were solely economic. Forced burial in woolen was a religious and a cultural shock. Bernard Mandeville, author of The Fable of the Bees, wrote that those alive in 1678 must remember the general clamour that was made against it. At first, nothing could be more shocking to thousands of people than that they were to be buried in woolen. Jesus was buried in linen, therefore it's a biblical tradition, and it's a centuries-old burial practice. So this paper examines why the shocking idea of burial in wool became widely accepted, and how fast practice changed. Despite the social and ritual implications of the significant change to burying in woolen, the impact of the act has not been systematically examined, and scholars of death often focus on other issues. Motivations for burial in linen are difficult to uncover, and relatively little has been written on the change in practice. Julian Lytton's single page on burial in woolen misleadingly argues that elite burial in linen after 1666 was motivated by a desire to distinguish themselves from the rest of the population. And his argument is based on a misinterpretation of Aubrey's life of Thomas Hobbes, which states that, and uh, Lytton states that Hobbes's burial in wool related to the fact that he didn't get his pension from Charles II. But contrary to Lytton's accounts, more, um, mourners were actually very handsomely entertained. The most detailed and convincing account is from 1792 by Phyllis Cunnington and Catherine Lucas, who suggest that vanity and pride were key motivations, and I'll look at these later. The Act promoted import substitution. Hardly any linen was produced in England in the 17th century, and linen was the second highest English import after groceries. Therefore, it was a key target to be replaced with English products. There seems to be initial resistance to the Act, because it had to be reintroduced in 1678 with detailed enforcement instructions. And this reintroduction matched other government measures against linen imports in the same year. Um, So in 1678, trade with France was prohibited, and this was directly aimed at linens and luxury wines. (coughs) A third of linen used in England came from France. Therefore, these two actions together had a significant effect on the supply and use of flax and cloth. The 1678 Act also contributed a new motivation. It benefited paper manufacture because burial in woolen meant that more linen rags were available for making paper. The main practical implication of the Act was that domestic linens could no longer be used for winding sheets. People were required to buy new woolen goods for their debt, but little is known about the mass manufacturing of woolen burial textiles. In the late 17th century, people (coughs) were buried in winding sheets, which were tied at the top and the bottom to hold the body in place. And you can see this illustrated on the slide. And the image on the right is my favorite because the artist has used their artistic license to see through the shroud and show you the naked body underneath, which is highly essential for a piece of administrative paper. Um, Julian Lytton states that the winding sheet began a gradual decline in the 17th century 
And after 1700, something that was effect effectively like a hospital gown was used. So it was an open-backed, long-sleeved shift with drawstrings at the wrist and neck, and that was used until 1775. The shifts were shaped with ruching or gathered pleats along the length of the garment and might have bows sewn additionally for decoration, but they were still tied at the bottom. Large sheets were attached to the coffin by undertakers from 1730 and then wrapped around the body which was dressed in a shift which made the corpse look like they were in bed. And you can see an example of this on this slide. And the woolen draper John Elphick has emphasised the peaceful sleeping corpse to potential customers. And particularly because it takes up a quarter of the space of his trade card. The figure appears to be dressed in a shirt or shift decorated with ruching. And the dots on the frilled edge of the garment are pinking, which is decorative holes created through punching a design through the fabric. But it's still tied at the bottom like the shroud showed <coughs> earlier. The economic significance of the acts was substantial. Wrigley and Schofield estimated that there were over 219,000 deaths in 1665 and nearly 125,000 in 1677. Both of these were the years before that the, act, the acts were passed, and I've chosen them because perceived numbers of deaths would have influenced the vote. Working on the premise that winding sheets were typically household sheets and therefore needed two lengths of linen sewed together, one sheet required 5.2 yards of linen, and I've based this on surviving sheets. People were also buried in a shirt or shift, and these required three and a half yards of linen. So this totals at 8.7 yards per person. In total, a maximum of nearly 1.9 million yards would have been saved from burial in 1665 if everyone obeyed the act and nearly 1.1 million yards in 1677. And I've rounded these figures just for the ease of reading them out to you. While it was uh, unlikely that everyone would replace the shirt and sheet, shirt, shirt and sheet, the potential savings were huge. If the 1.1 million yards buried was replaced by new imports of Hambra linen, the English would have profited by saving over £120,000 in 1677, and this is after the loss of the 7.5% import duties. And I've chosen Hambra linen because it was cheap at 30 pence a yard compared to Holland, which was 48 pence. So it's more representative of the wider uh, population's textiles. The Act instead channeled this money towards the English woolen trade, essential for import substitution. So from the first full year of implementation in 1679 to 1695, which was the year before Ireland was allowed duty-free linen exports to England, the importation of up to 23 million yards was prevented, which was a profit of £2,555,200 after the subtraction of income loss from import duties. Enforcement measures were wide-ranging. Clergymen were were required to keep a register of the fibre that people were buried in, which was based on a writ written affidavit from two witnesses sworn in front of a magistrate or officer within eight days of burial. The witnesses swore that the deceased was not buried in any fibre but sheep's wool only, and affidavits were used to record witness statements and could be bought from stationers and bookshops like the example on the slide. But they also commonly used handwritten versions. The affidavit had to be taken before a JP or other local chief officer who couldn't charge for taking the oath. In 1680, an additional act for burial in Woolen extended this to clergymen outside the parish due to the, the quote, great loss of time in travelling to JPs. If no affidavit was brought to the clergyman within eight days, they were to inform the church warden or overseers of the poor who had to apply to the JP for a warrant to levy the fine. Overseers had to present accounts of all burials to the JPs at quarter or petty sessions or monthly JP meetings. And all of these actions were enforced by five pound fines. A quarter went to the king, half went to support the poor of the parish and the final quarter to the informant. If someone was buried in linen or the affidavit was not presented in time, a five pound fine was levied, which was raised through the distress and sale of goods owned by the deceased. If this wasn't possible, there was a whole series of other measures, 
So it came from the person in whose house they died, the person who buried them in linen, from their master or mistress, or if they lived with their parents, from the lack of gifts. <coughs> and the fine had to be paid before any other statute, judgment, <coughs> debt, legacy, or other duty. So it always had to be paid. The fine was equally divided between the informer and the poor of the parish. The informer could be a family member, so the fine could be reduced to two pounds ten shillings, but this was not guaranteed. In the Somerset parish of Cucklington, the informer was listed for ten out of eighteen burials. Only two of the deceased shared surnames with the informers, while no one with the surname Watts informed on the eleven Watts burials. In the neighbouring parish of Henstridge, only three of seven burials in linen had the informer listed, and the surname of only one of these matched the deceased, so it looks like at least some of the families paid the full fine. Judges and JPs had to give the act in charge at sizes and quarter sessions, and awareness of the act was enforced for at least seven years, so it had to be read after the service on the first Sunday after the feast of St Bartholomew for seven years. And there was even legal protection for people who enforced the Acts. The Act was extended to Scotland in 1707, which repealed a 1686 Act for burying in Scots linen, which did what it said on the tin. The Scots linen Act was based on the English Woolen Act and copied the methods of enforcement. But fines were much higher at £25 sterling for noblemen and over £16 for the rest. And the Act for Bearing in Woolen was extended to Ireland in 1734. There was a single exemption in the Act, which was that victims of the plague could be buried in linen. And this exception was likely to have been related to understandings of contagion. And these continued into the 18th century. In 1767, Johannes Fuzzlus published a medical text which stated slightly confusing, that in the cases of the plague, a, subs a suspension should be made of bearing in anything but woolen. Nay, that should be forbidden, as it is a powerful retainer of infection. Linen here should be preferred. He still considered linen to be a carrier of contagion, however, advising that, along with other textiles and furniture, it should be buried to contain infection. The demise of the Act, with its repeal in 1814, is most likely to relate to the reduced significance of woolen in exports and the diversification of English trade and manufacturing interests. European demand for English woolens did not grow over the 18th century due to national pushes for self-sufficiency on the continent. The American colonies and West Indies provided alternative and lucrative markets, but diversification of English manufacturing interest, including into linen and cotton, meant that a policy designed in a period of English woolen manufacturing dominance was less relevant by 1814. Adherence to the Act seems to have been less common from the 1760s, when many burial registers end, even though there are pages that they could still go on and use. In 1792, William Nelson, writing for overseers, stated that affidavits were still taken in some parishes, while in many it is not regarded at all. However, burial in woolen continued in some areas. Infant foundlings who died while at nurse in West Peckham were buried in wool in the late 1770s. And in the first decade of the 19th century, affidavits were still taken in Thorn Falcon Parish in Somerset. Although measures introduced for the enforcement of the Act were thorough, with penalties for everyone in the uh, enforcement process, Burial in Willen did not become entirely ingrained in the English psyche by the 19th century. After the repeal of the Act, there was a rapid change to other fibres, particularly cotton. And you can see an example of cotton burial clothes from 1824 on the slide, and this shift might be price related. <coughs> the economic benefits for the woolen trade of the Act trumped cultural and religious concerns. In the 1720s, Several authors commented on the success of the English Act. Mandeville stated that the benefit that accrues to the nation from it is so visible that nothing could ever be said in reason to condemn it, a benefit that supposedly contributed to its wider acceptance. Nicholas Amherst considered the Act to be acknowledged on all hands to be the greatest support of the wealth of this nation. Jonathan Swift advised the adoption of burying an Irish woolen as a fashion in Ireland to reduce reliance on English imports. 
However, the economic purpose of the act was not universally praised. Jethro Tull, inventor of the sea drill, argued that low wool prices were due to overproduction in England, illustrated by the act, which, because the living are not sufficient to consume it, obliges the dead to wear it. Another writer dismissed it as though great in its prospect, nothing in its consequences. Burial in, religion, in linen had religious origins. All four gospels specify that Jesus was wrapped in linen before he was placed in his tomb. Linen is a key part of the resurrection in the gospels of Luke and John and is ma- mentioned in Matthew and Mark. And every Easter day, one of these passages would have been read. Therefore, the Christian connotations of burial in linen were widely understood. Jesus' wrappings remained in the tomb, testifying that his body had been present and marking his absence. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which first came to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. Concerns about the break from this religious tradition appear in several places. The tantalizing record of a 1677 debate in the House of Commons reveals continued opposition to the 1666 Act. Two arguments against the Act were recorded and both were religious. Edward Waller, MP for Hastings, commented, our savior was buried in linen and that burial in wool was a thing against the custom of nations, and I am against it. The Secretary of State for the Southern Department, Henry Coventry, added, great men of the Romish religion desire to be buried in the habit of some order that they devote themselves to, some some the Franciscan, some the Dominican, but all in woolen. I fear this bill may taste of popery. The arguments against Waller and Coventry were not recorded, and despite the strongly worded opposition, economic concerns won out. It was not even a close vote, with 113 for and 53 against in the House of Commons, and the bill was passed without amendment in the House of Lords. Despite the importance of Jesus' burial in linen in the resurrection story, it was possible to introduce the act for burying in woolen because, as Dr. Isaac Watts reflected, burial in wool was neither commanded nor forbidden by God. Religious concerns also appear in the pamphlet The Good Wife's Lamentation, or the women's complaint on the account of their being to be buried in wool from 1678, which satirised arguments against the act. The Good Wives discussed the end of the practice of burial in wedding smocks or shifts. The author counted concerns about this loss of tradition with a religious reproach, comparing wedding smocks to sacred relics and stating that their attention implies we intended our pride should survive our bodies and defy our mortality, or tempt the devil to be kind to us if we should happen into his company. Further reproach is employed against other supposedly misinformed views, when Mrs. Tabitha Lipseal, who had screwed her face into the Geneva print and was therefore a more radical Protestant, stated that it was a popish de- device to make us do penance after we are dead. Lipseal said that she would not be buried in wool whilst I have a day to breathe, a comment that led to weeping and the melancholy dispersal of the group. But this was also a concern for the senior minister, Henry Coventry, and the lamentation could have been a political satire, but there's no direct connection between the names, so it's difficult to tell. Samuel Hill, the Archdeacon of Wells, explored ideas of conscience and religious choice in 1708. He asked his reader to consider the intention of the law, whether it affects the conscience of the subject under the peril of guilt of sin towards God, or only has a sub-penal design to promote some lighter conveniences, such as appearances at sheriff's turns, juries, bearing in woolen, and the like. Hill's inclusion of bearing in woolen alongside jury duty both shows that it was widely accepted as unproblematic and also instructed dissenting readers that it was not an issue of conscience. The minister, Matthew Henry, similarly suggested that burial in wool was not an issue. It is not a necessity that in all circumstances we imitate the burial of Christ, he being buried after the manner of the Jews. That's a quote from John. It teaches us that in in things of this nature, we should conform to the usages of the country where we live, 
except in those that are superstitious. Concerns remained outside the Church of England. Quakers considered compliance with the Act as against their conscience. Francis Bug, who was strongly anti-Quaker, critiqued them in 1710, stating that the act which forced them to go to the ministers, who they call Baal's priests, with affidavits, this was a case of conscience. But the five pound penalty soon removed this scruple. Bug indicates Quaker struggles between religious conscience and the fine, um, which emphasizes that monetary consequences was sufficiently punitive to force compliance with the law. The Bering and Woolen Act also contravened Jewish practice, and sufficient money was collected from fines in the Jewish cemeteries at Mile End that it was divided between the poor of all hamlets in Stepney Parish. Custom was recognised as a factor that influenced reactions to burial in Woolen. Mandeville considered custom and emulation as key catalysts of the acceptance of burial in wool. In 1723, he stated that the undeniable economic benefits of the act in a few years made the horror conceived against it lessen every day. I observed then that the young people who had seen but few in their coffins did the soonest strike in with the innovation, but that those who, when the act was made, had buried many friends and relations remained adverse to, remained adverse to it the longest and I remember many that could never be reconciled to it to their dying day. By this time, bearing in linen being almost forgot, it is the general opinion that nothing could be more decent than woolen and the present manner of dressing a corpse, which shows that our liking or disliking of things chiefly depends on mode and custom and the precept and example of our betters. This passage was not included in the first edition of The Fable of the Bees in 1714, either because opinion changed slowly or because um, it was an example that contributed to the substantial enlargement of the second edition in 1723. Mandeville's argument that generational turnover reduced concern and led to a change in custom is convincing. Cultural expectations change. However, he didn't prove the role of emulation. <coughs> Numerous mentions of the Bering and Woolen Act in contemporary literature, including poetry and plays, also speak to the customary importance of burial in linen. And again, the MP Edward Waller considered burying in woolen a thing against customs of nations, which was a justification of his opposition to the act. While Lytton has suggested that a social cachet developed around burial in linen, motivating choice of this material, Cunnington and Lucas have written the best evidenced account of reasons for burial in woolen and posit that vanity and pride were key motivations. Concerns about the act were typically dismissed in pamphlets by associating them with stereotypical women's concerns. Vanity, fashion, pride and ignorance were considered appropriately damning associations by supporters of the act. Alexander Pope's critical imagining of the last words of the actress Mrs. Oldfield are on the <coughs> slide. Oldfield was buried in finery including Brussels lace, which was made from linen yarn and a Holland shift. So, in particular, odious in woolen, twitter saint to provoke. Other evidence provided includes Richard Steele's widow in the funeral from 1702, who said that, if you should outlive me, take care I'm not buried in flannel, would never become me, I'm sure. Cunnington and Lucas's argument is also supported by a discourse between a mule and man and a stabler's wife. The latter described burial in woolen as an ugly fashion, demoting it to a concern for the vain. The lamentation also uses this trope. The anonymous author derided the conversation of the good wives, drunk on burnt claret, near hysterical, over emotional, and nearly fainting at the mention of the act. Mrs. Protope said that she would pay the five pound fine to bury her husband in linen, rather than he shall travel so long a journey as into the other world like a beggar without a shirt to his back. Comically adding, I mean, our humour, I hope is different, but comically adding, if we must make a banquet for worms, why should we not allow the poor creatures, napkins and table linen at their dinner to wipe their chaps after it? Another woman complained of the tenderest skin, which blistered if it was not touched by expensive Holland smocks and silk stockings, 
adding, if they should offer to case me in woolen, I should never lie at quiet in my grave. However, accusations of vanity and pride only appear in satirical works. Therefore, it's extremely difficult to work out whether they were actually motivations. So, so to sum up so far, the motivations given for burial in linen by contemporaries were religion, custom, vanity, pride, snobbery, and stupidity. And untangling the polemic from the truth can only be undertaken through examining the success of the 1678 Act through burial registers, which listed, listed what fibre people were buried in and referrals to church wardens or overseers. Archaeological artefacts are of limited use to assess the change to burial in wool because uh, there's very limited survival of textiles and there's also a sample bias towards animal fibres because they degrade much slower than cellulosic fibres such as flax which is used to produce linen. An archaeological study of the burials at the crypt in Christchurch Spitalfields suggests that the act was generally adhered to before 1814, and of the small number of dated burials with surviving textiles, those before 1814 were all in wool, apart from three in the 1790s where pieces of silk were found, and this perhaps indicates an increasing laxity in the lead up to the abolition of the act. Rates of change in burial registers indicate that religious conscience, custom and vanity were considered less important than the fine or economic benefits. The fine was prohibitive for the poor, but anyone with an estate of at least five pounds could literally afford the fine, meaning that there was the potential for widespread disobedience. However, this did not emerge in the burial records for, so for Somerset parishes or the two Kent parishes examined. Complete success of the act was prevented by the small numbers of people who chose to be buried in linen decades later. So I'm going to use two Somerset parishes to examine the rate of change to burial in Woolen, and they're in within 10 miles of each other as the slide shows. The act was enforced in Cucklington from 1678 to 1760 when the burial register ends, and enforcement ended in Hensdridge in 1758. There was apparently only one transgression in clergy enforcement when the Cucklington rector was, I think, harshly fined in 1684 for not detailing the distribution of Elizabeth Watt's fine to the poor. It's clear that there was clergy engagement with the process. Joseph Hopkins' certificate was brought late in 1732, and it was noted in the burial register that it was under the hand of the rector of Oberon, which I did not think authentic. But despite this, Hopkins was not referred for a fine. The Cucklington Burial Register contains 505 entries, 261 women, 239 men, and five of uncertain gender. And there were 18 burials in linen, which is nearly 4% of all burials. The first was recorded in 1682, and the last in 1755. So 77 years after the second act was passed, people still chose to be buried in linen, indicating the continued cultural significance of the practice. Uncovering individual attitudes is impossible due to the reticence of burial registers and gravestones, but you can identify patterns from the registers. Eleven of the 18 people buried in linen were from the Watts family, who were members of the local gentry. It's unclear whether religion or status influenced their decision to bury family members in linen, but it's possible that custom and tradition also had an influence. Intriguingly, intriguingly, two members of the family, Richard and Mary, were buried legally in wool rather than linen. Despite his burial in linen, there's a monument to Nicholas Watts in St Lawrence's Church, Cucklington, shown on the slide. So if you, go th if you were to go through the arches on the right of the image and look to the right, you would see the monument. The monument confirms that burial in linen did not preclude uh, burial or memorialisation within the church which was a higher status location than the churchyard. Furthermore, Nicholas was a church warden, but was still buried in linen. Um, so leaders in the church community were also buried illegally. Probate documents provide no insight. Survival is exceedingly poor. And the wills of Hugh and Nicholas Watts both survive, um, which is a rare survival, but neither specified burial in linen in their wills, although in other areas, people did request it. <coughs> 
Other Cucklington residents buried in linen were Dorothy Nichols, a gentleman's wife, and the gentleman Robert Knight. The status of the remaining individuals is unknown. Margaret Lane Law, Mary Brickle, the wife of James Ryle, Mary Ringle, and Mary Dalton. Brickle was buried in the churchyard, a lower status location, and there was a gender bias. So women made up 12 out of 18 linen burials, and the only men buried in linen were from the Watts family. Henstridge, within 10 miles of Cocklington, is a useful comparison. The burial register contained the deaths of 562 men, 652 women, and nine people of unknown gender. Seven out of 1,223 entries, or 0.6%, were linen burials and they were focused between 1684 and 1715. But there was a larger, ambiguous group of uh, 28 entries where an affidavit was not brought within eight days. So these cases were <coughs> referred to church wardens and treated as though they were buried in linen. Information on the fines doesn't survive, so it's not clear how many of the cases were buried in linen or whether they just had disorganized survivors. So I'm going to refer to these ambiguous entries as unclear, and these were between 1678 and 1758. The Henstridge burial registers also indicate a strong relationship between status and burial in linen. From 1678 to 1707, they listed burial locations at the church for 460 out of 462 people, and the locations were churchyard, church, and then more specifically aisle and chancel. Comparison of location of burial with fibre type provides a means of establishing the relationship between status and burial in linen. Unsurprisingly, the three travellers who died in Henstridge were all buried in wool. Inside the church, there were five linen burials, 48 woollen burials, and two unclear burials. <coughs> Only the gravestone of the Bingham family still survives in the church, which you can see on the slide, and all of the Binghams were buried in wool. The vicar of Henstridge was one of the unclear entries from within the church, and he was likely to be buried in wool because 14 years earlier he did not disobey the act when he buried his wife. Three of the five linen burials were from the Couth family, Jonathan and his two children, again showing a family pattern similar to the Watts in Cucklington. And at least 401 out of 403 churchyard burials were in Woolen. So linen burials in Henstridge from 1678 to 1707 were most likely to be inside the church. Therefore, there was a connection between wealth and burial in linen. There was no gender bias in Henstridge. Three women and four men were buried in linen. And amongst the unclear entries, there was actually a male bias. So 15 out of 28 of the deceased were men. And this is an underrepresentation of women because nearly 100 more women were buried in the parish. The majority of people in Cocklington and Henstridge quickly shifted to burying their dead in Woolen, thus favouring personal or national, uh, the personal or national economic impact of the custom of the act over custom, religion, and pride. In the Henstridge Register, linen burials only constituted 0.6% of all burials, or up to 3% if we include the unclear burials. In the Cocklington Register, 4% of burials were in linen. And these percentages indicate a significant decline in linen burials from 1678, which is particularly striking given that Mandeville states that the act caused a national outcry. So if this was true, why didn't more people dissent? This change, <coughs> this change in custom is all the more remarkable when another attempt to reduce reliance on linen cloth failed in the 1680s. The East India Company ordered 200,000 shirts and shifts made from cotton from Madras in 1682, which was an act considered to be of national benefit because it aimed to reduce reliance on European linen imports. However, cotton underwear was not popular with consumers, and Giorgio Riello suggests that this is because a tactile training was needed to familiarise people with cottons. Burial in Woolen therefore not only benefited from political intervention and a five pound fine, but Woolen burial garments and shrouds were out of sight after burial, and therefore they did not require the same day-to-day -day physical interactions as cotton underwear. <coughs> 
Woolen textiles were also a familiar English material. The enforcement measures in the 1678 Bering and Woolen Act were clearly effective enough to lead to widespread change in Cocklington and Henstridge. However, a small minority of people still chose burial in flax and cloth. So there was a relationship between locality and the rate of change. The villages are, only, uh, are within 10 miles of each other, but there were differences in their burial practices. So I analysed the number of burials in the first 30 years after the 1678 Act. Around 1% of burials in Henstridge were in linen, in contrast to over 5% of Cucklington burials. Change was faster in Henstridge, partly because the Cucklington Watts family were stalwarts of burial <coughs> in linen. And linen burials did decline slightly in Cucklington from 1708 to 1760. There were only eight burials. There were no specifically linen burials in uh, Hensdridge from after 1715, but there were 24 unclear burials, which could have been linen. Therefore, we don't actually know whether the parish became more or less obedient. The 1678 Act certainly did not quash all burials in linen, and the practice continued after burial in woolen had become customary. In conclusion, the 1678 Bering and Woolen Act led to a rapid change in the textiles used to dress the majority of the English dead. Economic forces were sufficiently strong to overpower other factors. The act, motivated by economic gain, um, was successful in its aim to overcome centuries of tradition, and the £5 fine was sufficiently high to deter the majority from burying their dead in any other textile of wool. Religious objections from some members of the Church of, Over Church of England was overcome, um, and it appears that Quakers and Jewish people didn't adhere to the practice, but further research is needed on this. Contemporary commentary strongly indicates that vanity and pride led to re the rejection of woolen cloth, which was not showy, and this is contrary to Lytton's idea of social cachet. However, the day-to-day -day truth of these satires is unclear. The importance of custom largely died out with generational turnover. Anxieties caused by the change of custom were also mostly counteracted by the fine. But the continuation of burial in linen reveals its continued cultural significance for the material culture of death. And further support for the cultural significance of linen is that although witnesses were required to swear that the deceased was not buried in any fibre other than wool, alternatives were hemp, silk, hair, gold or silver. And despite this, only linen transgression was what recorded in the burial registers. People who chose to be buried in linen made a choice not to be buried in more expensive textile status symbols, silks and textiles with precious metals. In the Somerset parishes studied, burial in linen was mainly an elite practice, but specific motivations are unclear. The Watts family, nearly all of whom were buried in linen, could have been motivated by religion, pride, vanity or custom. Although the study of Henstridge revealed that the vast majority of these listed as buried in linen were buried in the church rather than the churchyard, the idea that burial in linen was intended to demarcate elite burials cannot be proved from the burial registers. The difference in burial practice between two villages in close proximity suggests that local, local and regional differences in rates of change were rife. Overall, it is clear that burial practice changed significantly after the 1678 Bering and Woolen Act, as the cultural norm was forcibly destroyed, became illegal and subject to a fine that discouraged the majority of the population. Parliament's plan to introduce import substitution was successful. Thank you.